Our guest today is the exceptionally talented composer Danny Elfman, who has scored more than a hundred films since the mid-1980s. In addition to his four Oscar nominations for the scores of hits like Goodwill Hunting and Men in Black, Danny has also received two Emmys and a Grammy amidst multiple nominations for both. You know his range of work from The Simpsons theme to many collaborations with director Tim Burton, including Batman, Edward Scissorhands, and Pee-wee's Big Adventure. I recently sat down with Danny in his Hollywood studio to talk about another legendary film he did with Tim Burton. Thank you, Danny, for having us today. My pleasure. Let's go back to the beginning. When did you first hear about The Nightmare Before Christmas? Well, Tim called me and he said, yeah, I got this thing and it's actually from this thing I did ages ago and uh, Disney wants to make it. And, and, you know, he kind of showed me some images from it and we talked about it, but then nothing happened for quite a while because he was working on a script and setting up, you know, Henry Selleck getting his studio together and how it was all going to work. And, and then there was a certain point where it was like, yeah, Henry's ready to go into production and we still don't have a script <laughs> and uh, we got to do something. And, I, and he says, let's start with the songs. And so we did. So it was always going to be song heavy? There were always going to be several songs in the production? Well, we didn't know how many. We just kind of approached it like, let's see what part of the story we could tell in song and then figure it out from there. I mean, no, there's no handbook on how to do a musical, animated musical feature. Did he have the story pretty much laid out? Did he know what the main beats were and how they needed to get from point A to point B? Yeah, he had the gist of the story. He didn't have all the characters fleshed out, but there was a story that he'd put together with drawings that evidently he did when he was at Disney, when he was a young animator, and it got stashed away and forgotten. And somebody found it, said, we got this Tim Burton thing. And they were like, okay. So the way we started literally was he would come over to the house and he would show me these drawings and he would tell me part of the story. And I said, just pretend like you're telling a story to like a nephew or a niece at bedtime or something like that. And um, he'd go, okay, well, it starts out Halloween Town and, da, 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 and they're all celebrating and Jack is writing in the town and they're all singing. And he had little bits of lines and some lyrics that, that he had done also. And I think people forget that Tim is actually a really good lyricist himself. He's good with rhyme. Before I met him, he did this uh, piece called uh, Vincent, which was all done to his verse. And uh, so he had like lots of really good snippets of things. And so he would just describe it and I'd start hearing bits in my head and then he'd finish that sequence and I'd go, okay, that's it. He goes, you want to know anymore? Nope, go, right now, go, go. And I'd run into the other room and um, start the song. And about three days later, I'd call him, I'd say, you want to hear a song? And he'd come over and I'd play him, this is Halloween. And he was like, yeah, cool, all right. And I go, so what happens now? And it was just like that. And we just kind of did this a uh, couple times a week until we had 10 songs. Boys and girls of every age, would you like to see something strange? Come with us and you will see this our town of Halloween. This is Halloween, this is Halloween. Pumpkin scream in the dead. No kidding, that's amazing. Had you ever worked like that before? Well, I'd never done anything like this before. I'd never done a musical before, really, like anything with a story and a narrative. The irony is that my girlfriend at that time was the writer, Caroline Thompson. And I was living at her house because my house in Topanga Canyon was being renovated. So I spent like four or five months there and it was during this period. And so she's hearing everything. And she was so chomping at the bit and it's like, yeah, we got to get a script. And Caroline is sitting there going, hello, I'm right here. And finally it was like, oh yeah, Caroline, yeah, you should do the script. So how did Henry Selleck come into the picture as the director? So I don't really know, other than the what I understood early on is Tim, you know, we had a lot of stuff 
going on. He didn't really want to direct it. He wanted to produce it, be the creator, producer. Right. And have somebody uh, else, and he found Henry, to actually do the day-to-day. Because, you know, remember, Nightmare was in the middle of two Batman movies, and, right. uh, you know, he was pretty crazy busy. But that's just my guess, and I, I could be totally wrong. I never like to speak for Tim. Was it always going to be a stop-motion animation project? Oh, yeah, yeah. That, for sure, was always going to be stop-motion. Tim is into stop motion. He'd done Vincent to stop motion, and I think that was always the case. Should we explain to our listeners what stop motion animation is? Stop motion animation is a style that goes back to the turn of the century, but the, the most famous Hollywood stop motion would be King Kong. Right. And what stop motion means is you have a model. You're going to shoot it, and then you're going to move it a tiny little bit and shoot it again and a tiny little bit and shoot it again. And I would go up and watch this being done with Henry. Watching a stop motion studio is extraordinary because it's like a full, huge movie studio shrunk down small. A typical sound stage would be half the size of the room we're in now. And you'd have all these lights and cameras and these uh, animators working intensely exact to get the each shot. And they're going to move the fingers, they're going to move the head, they're going to move the neck, and they're going to constantly change heads to get the mouths and expressions to change. And so one character might have like a hundred heads. It's so complicated and so amazing to watch. And the thing I love about stop motion is that whatever you see is in camera. It's real. Everything is shot and framed just exactly like they would in a movie, but they're doing one frame at a time. It's not like digital where it's all being created in the computer. What I love about this is that it's almost like a Halloween operetta because the songs really do advance the story greatly. And there's so much, I mean, I think over half the film is actually songs. Well, that's just because we didn't know how else to do it and we just like fell into that. It's like, all right, why not? He had complete autonomy. I mean, Disney gave him, the, you just make your movie. We had nobody watching over us. There was no presentations that I ever had to do for anybody else. It was just Tim and I, and then Tim and I and Henry doing our thing. Maybe we should take a moment and say, and ask, what does Halloween mean to you? And how in your wheelhouse was this story? Well, Halloween was always my main special night of the year. Since I was a little kid, my least favorite night of the year was Christmas, and my favorite night of the year was Halloween. It wasn't until I had kids later that I was able to embrace Christmas because I was able to get into it through their perspective. And I realized then it was great. But growing up as a kid, I didn't have that. I always felt separate from everything. And on Halloween, I could just let my imagination run amok. I could be another character. And I felt like myself with a monster mask running around on Halloween. At Christmas, I was just a lonely Jewish kid in a neighborhood without Jewish friends and just imagining all my friends celebrating this magical holiday Christmas where they're holding hands with their family, sitting around the tree singing together. And it's like, I had nobody to play with. My brother, who was a little over four years older than me, was like, he wanted to beat me up. He didn't want to play with me. <laughs> <laughs> and so it was just a rough time of the year. So it was ironic when I got asked to do first Edward Scissorhands and then Nightmare Before Christmas. I'm working on Christmas movies. <laughs> and in hindsight, it's like, wow, these have become like real Christmas things. And here I was a kid, even as a young adult, it was like I'd feel the black clouds of, of depression, like riding in every December. As soon as I heard the first holiday music in a store with my mom, I would go glum. But Halloween was my night. My life as a child revolved around a movie theater here in Los Angeles called the Baldwin Hills Theater. And I was there almost every weekend of my childhood, except every now and then there was a movie. They'd play like a musical, and I wouldn't go. We'd boycott it, and we'd go to another theater. The one thing that was common is that unless it was fantasy, monsters, maybe action fantasy, monster fantasy, monster monster horror, <laughs> we weren't interested, period. You know, Mary Poppins came out. It's like you couldn't have dragged me into that theater. <laughs> so 
At this point, you had been pretty much working on film scores practically nonstop for the previous five or six years. And with Tim, you'd done Pee Wee and Beetlejuice and Batman and Edward Scissorhands. How tough was it to get back into songwriting mode? Because you'd kind of been away from the Oingo Boingo thing for a while. No, no, I was still in Oingo Boingo. Oh, okay. Yeah, I was in Oingo Boingo till 95. So this was in the, in the in-between years. Mm. But this was like a whole new experience for me because this was the first time ever that there was a story and there was a character. And I understood the character and I was singing from writing from the perspective of that character. And it's like, that's why every song took three days, top to bottom because I knew the character and I knew how he expressed himself. And I just understood it. I didn't have to reach for, uh, what do I want to write about, you know, this kind of torturous process. There was no torture. It's like, Jack Skellington wanders into a forest and sees three doors, and he gets sucked into this one, and when he comes out, he sees a new world called Christmas Town. And I'm just thinking of all the different things he would see and how he would express himself, because I understood at that point his personality. How much of Jack Skellington is you? A lot of me went into Jack Skellington, because at the time when I wrote it in the 90s, I was at the point where I really didn't want to be in a band anymore. And I didn't know how to get out of it, because I was in a band for years, and then suddenly I had this film career dropped into my lap, and I was very successful at it. And uh, being a guilt-driven human, the idea of abandoning the band for a, what seemed like a more lucrative career was not an option. So I warned them every year for five years. I said, this is our last year, this is our last year. But I understood what it was like when you're a songwriter and lead singer in a band, you are the king of your own little mini bubble world. And it's a micro world, a micro universe, but it's your universe. And that's what Jack was. And I knew what it was like to have this universe where people adored you, but you wanted out. And you couldn't explain why you're doing really well. People love your shows. And I love doing the shows. And I really loved the guys in the band. There was no friction. I just, in my heart, I just didn't want to be in a band anymore. And this was Jack Skellington. And this dilemma. was Jack Skellington. So that just got really wrapped right into Jack's personality. I have to say, though, in terms of the concept of the, of the film, it seems pretty subversive to kidnap and torture Santa Claus. Don't use torture. Because <laughs> when the movie came out, it was so misunderstood. And I did a three-day press junket in Orlando. And every journalist who came in said two things to me. One is, it's not for kids, right? I go, no, of course it's for kids. I hear Santa Claus gets tortured. And I go, he's not tortured. <laughs> he is hung up. He's mildly inconvenienced. <laughs> and at the end, he's not even particularly upset by it. <laughs> it's true. You know, it's like, it's all fine. It's not like he's tortured. He got a little bit of mistreatment. Wait, I've got a better plan to catch this big red lobster man. Let's pop him in a boiling pot and when he's done, we'll butter him up. Kidnap the Sandy Claus, throw him in a box. Bury him for 90 years, then see if he talks. But this is also a Disney movie. This is a Disney movie. And so I'm wondering, do I dare even ask, was there some concern on the part of studio executives that you'd gone too far with this? Oh, the, Disney didn't understand it at all. And how could they? I look back in hindsight, and I don't fault them for it. There was no way for them to understand what this thing was. And I was at the one preview for kids and they just came out of it. And I was in the elevator with the, some of the executives and the producer. And it was like, well, kids hate it. Yep, they hate it. And starting the next week, all the merchandising stopped. So this was a test screening. There's a only test screening. And kids went in there expecting the Little Mermaid and they got Nightmare Before Christmas. <laughs> and so I think, you know, Disney just didn't know what it was. To their credit, 10 years later, they did. And a Nightmare is one of those rare, rare things that got a second life. I was with him in uh, Tokyo for uh, the opening of Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. 
and there was nightmare merchandise everywhere. And we went to a nightclub that was a nightmare before Christmas themed nightclub in Tokyo. <laughs> and Tim's looking at, we went to toy stores together, you know, and there was Jack and Sally stuff. And it's kind of like, I think it kind of sunk in that this thing is still alive. And then after that, Disney started going, okay, we get it now. And they started putting energy into it. And I, if anything I worked on that didn't have a successful life that I could have wished a second life upon, it was that. And it happened. So I consider it to be just a great, lucky blessing. Normally, when I score a film, I'm on it for three months. I was on Nightmare for close to two years. And I'd never been on anything like that. So it's close to your heart. Very close to my heart. Jack's character was very close to my heart. And I really loved and believed in the whole thing. And then to see it misunderstood, and it wasn't like a total flop, but it certainly it just kind of came and went fairly quickly. It just kind of killed me. And it's the greatest vindication for me. People come up with their little kids. And I, I also get stuff sent to me all the time, kids singing songs from it. And seeing generation after generation, kids loving it. And each time it's like, yes, I told you. <laughs> that's what I was saying in the very beginning. They'd say, it's not for kids. And I go, no, that's not true. My daughter, Molly, is 10. And I've played her every song as I've been writing them and, and the whole story. And she's like totally into it. I said, well, it's too scary. I, and I would say this, does Halloween scare your kids? And they go, no, they love it. I said, then this movie's not too scary. Disney's Four Scores is brought to you by the Four Scores playlist, featuring music and interview clips from each composer featured in the podcast series, including Danny Elfman's score, for the Nightmare Before Christmas. Twas a long time ago, longer now than it seems, in a place that perhaps you've seen in your dreams. Talk a little bit about the style of the songs, will you? Because I, I think they're wonderfully diverse. Seems like there's a little Cab Calloway in Oogie Boogie's song. Sally's song maybe has kind of a little Kurt Vile vibe. Oh, yeah. Can you talk a little bit about the style that you wrote? Yeah, I mean, the only decision that Tim and I made in the beginning was that we did not want it to sound like a contemporary musical or a Broadway musical. Like nothing that felt like it was of that world. It had to be of its own universe. And it was my personal desire that the songs would have a kind of a timeless quality that you couldn't tell. Could this song have been written in the 90s or written in the 40s? That was my goal. And Tim was on board with that. So I just went to my own inspirations for musicals. And that was, for me, Kurt Weill, Three Penny Opera, was the first musical that really opened my eyes to like how amazing a musical could be. And Gilbert and Sullivan. So what's this? I was definitely thinking of one of those fast Gilbert and Sullivan songs that's almost like a tongue twister. And I remember, because I didn't know if I was going to sing it or not. And I was like, yeah, good luck to whoever <laughs> sings this song. That's not me. <laughs> Make it as hard as possible. It's a mishmash of styles, but you've got Gilbert and Sullivan, you've got Kurt Vile, you've got a little bit of classic kind of Rodgers and Hammerstein, because I did love the, the older musicals. You know, I didn't always hate Broadway <laughs> musicals. I used to act, there's actually some really good ones. And of course, Cab Calloway, because as anybody who looks into my life would know that before I was in Oingo Boingo, I spent seven, eight years in the Mystic Nights of the Oingo Boingo. And that was based around 1933 jazz. And uh, Chamber, somewhere between Cab Calloway, Duke Ellington, and Prokofiev all got mixed together with the Mystic Nights. And I used to do Cab Calloway numbers on stage. I sang like two or three of his songs. I was infatuated with Cab Calloway. I knew that was also one of the two songs I wouldn't sing. Sally's song, obviously, and Oogie Boogie. I imagined it for a heavier voice than mine. And we did a bunch of auditions. When I heard Ken Page, it was like, we don't need to hear anymore. <laughs> this is the guy. Yeah, this is the guy. Yeah. Oh, wow. Now, or you must face the dire consequences. The children are expecting me, so please come to your senses. So, how did you go from just singing the demos to being the voice of Jack Skellington? 
Okay. After I did like the home demos in Caroline's garage, <laughs> Tim and I went into a studio because now we needed to give Henry some good sounding demos. Well, had he already started shooting at this he point? He hadn't. He needed stuff to start. Oh, of course. So we went into the studio, Tim and I, and in one night we cut all 10 songs. I mean, I had all the instruments recorded, but I did all the voices for every character except for Sally. You know, obviously I couldn't sing <laughs> Sally's song, but I sang all the other parts. And it was this one long night. And those were the songs that we sent to Henry. But it was at the end of that session where I was starting to go, all right, this is gonna be a problem. You know, we never talked about it, but if Tim wants to get a more famous singer or more of a classical singer or something, there's gonna be a series of horrible accidents you know, this singer is walking down the street on Fifth Avenue and a piano falls on his head. Then the next guy gets hired and something equally bizarre happens. <laughs> oh, terrible tragedy. And finally, they're gonna go, Danny, you've gone through five singers. Can you do it? And I'll go, oh, well, all right. <laughs> but at the end of that, I was going, Tim, you know, um, Jack. And he goes, don't worry, you'll sing Jack. I was like, <laughs> what have I? What have I done? How could I be so blind? Looking back, we can't imagine anybody else doing well, it. Well, thank you. It was just, it was so personal for me at that point that I just felt like I needed to do it. And I also understood how Jack would sing with these kind of wild ups and downs and his kind of like schizophrenic personality. Mm. Did you have any input into the other casting, like, for example, Catherine O'Hara? Well, I didn't have input, meaning Tim wouldn't come to me, other than he says, you know, I'd hear, like, we're thinking of casting Catherine, and I was like, yes, because I knew Catherine's work really well. I was really excited. William Hickey, when he got cast, I was over the moon. And then, of course, Paul Rubens coming on. It, it was just, for me, it was just this pleasure of watching this cast come together. And then. I worked on putting together a vocal cast because all the voices were done by like five of us. And it, once again, I didn't have any organized way of doing it. There was no kind of musical director that I was turning it over to. I was just like, we can do this. Just, and we just all got around mics and we'd look at all the parts. I go, okay, you, me, you, you, we'll do the three vampires. Let's work out our harmonies. We practice it. We do those parts. And now, let's see, what do you do? You do the the face under the stairs. Oh, yeah, you got the wolf man. Okay, we got it. And we'd just like work out the parts and who was singing what part on the spot. So we could like quickly like, oh, let's like change our harmonies. Let's like, you take the top, I'll take the middle. Boom. How long did it all take to record all this stuff? It was all like in a week, you know, because I had a talented ready and able group of singers. You just wing it, you go by ear. It sounds like great fun. Yeah, it's also the only way I know how to work. <laughs> so it's not <laughs> like I had another way of doing it. So at some point, then the movie's finished, the vocals are all locked in, um, and you have to write the underscore. Well, first I had to record the final vocals because now they're like getting down to the nitty gritty. And it was an interesting process because we went into the studio again, now it's a year later. And it's like, okay, we're gonna get the final vocals. And I'd be in front of a good mic now in, in the studio and I'd do it two, three, four times and Tim would say, would you put on the demo? I'd just like to hear the demo and he'd put on the demo vocal. And he goes, Danny, I hate to say it, but the chorus, this verse, this part of this section here, I kind of like the demo more. And I'd listen, I'd go, yeah, I do too. And the interesting thing was that more than half the demo vocals ended up being final vocals because I couldn't top them. And uh, so when I went to record my album in the pandemic this last year, 18 songs, I remembered that. And every demo song ended up being the final vocal. Is it the energy? Is it the excitement of tackling something fresh? I actually have no idea other than Sometimes your first intuition approaching something just out of the blue brings a quality to it that even though I could technically do it more proficient later, doesn't make it better. 
So what about the underscore? Is it mostly rooted in the song material that you'd written? Yeah, the underscore was, was an interesting challenge because there's so many songs that really the score was just tying song to song. And the, the interesting puzzle is that before each song, I would be trying to pre-echo the melody of what's coming up before you hear it. Maybe you heard a few seeds planted before the song actually started. So it was a great jigsaw puzzle of pieces. And creative and, and fun sounding, because you hadn't really done anything quite like this. No, I'd never done anything like this. But you also got to realize that half the score was already written because it was the songs. And I'd already fully orchestrated and finished those. And so that is pretty much half of it. I think most critics liked it, didn't they? No, not necessarily. Some did, some didn't. One of the things I really enjoyed is, I think it was the LA Weekly, wrote a scathing review. Then I went to find it like 20 years later, and it was a different review. It got re-reviewed, and I thought that was really interesting. Generally speaking, critics didn't like the music, which yeah. I expected. Really? Yeah. And that's why it's the only musical that Disney ever put out that wasn't called a musical either. That's right. Yeah. Everybody shied away from the music because, you know, it's like we're expecting Broadway because it was simply understood that a musical is relying on the popular tastes of Broadway. And we weren't. The animated musicals that Disney was making at the time were very much Broadway oriented. Oh yeah, completely. And, and people loved that. And I came out with this music that was like, we didn't even know, we didn't even know, we didn't even know how to listen to this. What is this? <laughs> and so I appreciated that because I've got a twisted sensibility of sometimes when I'm hated, I love the fact that somebody hates what I'm doing passionately. It means I did something right. What, what I love is the fact that when you got a Grammy nomination, it was not in the soundtrack category. Yeah. Your Grammy nomination was for Best Children's Album. It was? Yes. Oh, I didn't know that. <laughs> there are few who deny it. What I do, I am the best. For my talents are renowned far and wide. When it comes to surprises in the moonlit night, I excel without ever even trying. Was the audience reaction at the time uh, generally favorable? Did it make money? I think it broke even. It was in that kind of area of it's like not a flop, definitely not a hit. So over the years, it gradually developed what I guess people would call a cult following. It developed a cult following. Did you see this happening? Would people come up to you and, and ask you about it? The thing that I noticed before I went to Tokyo with Tim was that you know, I was with the band and I would do autograph signings. And of all the scores and things I did, the things that people would most likely have for me to sign was Nightmare Before Christmas or Batman. And I said, that's so curious. So I, I realized that there was a lot of kind of hardcore Nightmare Before Christmas fans. And then at a certain point, I started seeing the tattoos. Oh, really? Yeah, and that started saying something to me. It's like, wow, cool, you're really committed to this. So <laughs> I knew that there was like a kind of a cult thing. What was the breakthrough moment where you and Disney and everybody understood, we need to embrace this and maybe celebrate it somehow? All I know is that suddenly Disney was going, hey, you know, we want to release it every year at the El Capitan. We want to convert a uh, haunted mansion to the nightmare. And, and, and just like, thank you. You know, it's so great that you're like totally now with a little bit of hindsight of understanding, you, under, you get it. I remember going to Disneyland and seeing that there was what they called an overlay of the haunted mansion mm -hmm. ride, which incorporated a lot of Nightmare Before Christmas elements. Mm -hmm. I didn't work on it, but they did tell me that they were doing it. And I was like, cool, great. And then years later, people like Marilyn Manson and Fiona Apple want to do covers. Yeah, I mean, obviously at that point, it was like, oh, this is just all icing on the cake. This is so cool. When did the idea of a live concert of Nightmare Before Christmas come about? Well, that would have been, I guess, 10 or 12 years ago, Richard Kraft and Laura Engel, my agents, approached me about doing a show at Albert Hall that was the orchestral renditions of Tim Burton scores. 
And I said, oh, that'd be kind of cool, but it's going to be a lot of work. Because I'd heard a couple of my pieces done live with orchestras two or three times, and I hated it. Always. It sounded awful. And I realized, of course, because I didn't write it for a live concert stage. I wrote it for a studio. And in the studio, you have control over your sound. So everything had to be redone. At a certain point, they asked me, would you be game to sing a couple of you know, nightmare songs? And as usually the case with me, I don't remember him asking me. I was thinking about something else. And I get really distracted. And I said yes. And then it was like six months later, I'm actually putting all these suites together. And it's like, oh my God, I have no idea if this is going to work or how it's going to work. And then I remember, did I say, and I called Richard up, or Laura, or both of them, and I said, did I say I was going to sing? And they said, yeah. And I said, well, tell them I'm not. I mean, that's not going to happen. That's just not going to happen. They said, well, it's too late. It's already been <laughs> publicized. And I'm like, oh, crap. <laughs> I haven't sung in 18 years. Before an audience. Before an audience. I couldn't get out of it. I didn't know if I could sing these songs. I'd never sung them live. So I didn't even know what it would take to sing them live. I always had stage fright my whole life. I mean, ever since the Mystic Nights and Oingo Boingo, I never got over it. And I was at the stage door, ready to go on. I had my you know, suit on and I was in makeup. And Helen and Bonham Carter was behind me. She's getting in character. She's going to sing Sally. And, and she could tell, you know, she said, Danny, what's going on? And I said, I don't think I can go in there. I think I'm not going to go in there. And then she said the magic words to me, Danny, what the? And I thought about it. I said, yeah, what the? And I just walked out there and I'd never performed for an English audience. Oingo Boingo had never played in London, so I had no idea what to expect. First off, I didn't know idea if the whole show was going to work. There was no previews. This was the first time ever in and the this, world. And this was at the Royal Albert Hall. Royal Albert Hall. And I'm going to sing for the first time in 18 years. And I went out there, and it's still one of the great moments in my life. I'd forgotten what it's like when you're performing for an audience, and the audience is not hostile. In fact, you get this feeling that it's okay. You screw up. You screw up. They're with you. Yeah, exactly. I didn't have a safety net and they were the safety net. I might have sung horribly, I don't know. I don't even remember singing the first two songs. But by the end of it, it was like, it just felt great. And it wasn't for about five or six years later that they approached me, what about doing Nightmare Before Christmas live in sync? Wow, with the picture. With the picture, and I was going, oh my God. You know, there's no breaks. There's not even time for musicians to turn pages. In a normal film score, you have big breaks. And, uh, you know, there might be a big cue of music or a sequence of music, and then there might be three or four or five or ten minutes before the next musical cue. Here you have a nightmare, you've got ten seconds, five seconds, two seconds. And this was at the Hollywood Bowl? No, no, this was actually in Tokyo. Oh, okay. Yeah, the very first show was in Tokyo. And the response from the audience must have been wild. It was really great. And then came the, the idea of the Hollywood Bowl, and I told them they're crazy. <laughs> That's way too big. And That's the bowl, insane. Yeah, the bowl has 17,000 17, seats. 17,000 <laughs> seats. And I was against it. I said, it's going to feel so sad being at the bowl with 1,500 people in it. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, I'll be surprised if you know, we get to 10% capacity. And what was it? It sold out. <laughs> and it just blew my mind. Talk about exoneration over a period of, it's, I think it'll be 30 years maybe since you started 60, working on it. Maybe 100. <laughs> <laughs> Who could tell these days? That's, I think it was about 100 years. That's right. That's right. I understand you're doing more concerts this fall. First time I'll have been on stage in three years. Yeah, because uh, we didn't do 2019. Then we were scheduled to be 2020, and of course it canceled. And, and, and can you tell us who your fellow performers will be? Sure. Well, first off, we're not at the Bowl. We're at the Bank of California Stadium. And Catherine could not do the show this year because she's in England shooting a movie. And so 
I'm pleased to say that the amazing young Billie Eilish will be singing the part of Sally. That's extraordinary. I sense there's something in the wind that feels like tragedies at hand. And though I'd like to stand by him, can't shake this feeling that I have. And uh, Paul Rubens also couldn't make it, so uh, singing the part of Locke will be uh, Weird Al Yankovic. Oh, great. And of course, Ken Page was still coming back as Oogie Boogie. Great. One more time, which I, oh, I would hate it if Ken couldn't do it. He is the definitive Oogie Boogie. He really is. Yeah. Do you have a favorite song from the score? Not really. I mean, there's a lot of songs that I, I had really fun writing, so I'll always remember that. So now, 28 years after its original release, what's your feeling about The Nightmare Before Christmas? I'm grateful. It's a lucky break that I'm getting to do this because I couldn't have projected at that moment in my wildest dreams that I'd ever be doing it live like this. And at the bowl at the Bank of California Stadium, I never could have imagined that in a million years. Life is strange and full of unexpected surprises, both good and bad, and this is one of the good ones. And now there's another whole generation, maybe two, that have embraced this movie. Yeah. And these characters. I mean, that again, that makes me the happiest. I see the young, so many young people in the audience. So it's a key part of the Elfman legacy now. I had two incredibly lucky breaks in my career. One was The Simpsons, <laughs> and like, never would have guessed. I thought The Simpsons wouldn't last six episodes and A Nightmare Before Christmas. Mm, that's great. Well, Danny, thank you for spending time with us today. It was my pleasure. Thank you for listening to Four Scores. Please subscribe and make sure to share this episode with your music-loving friends. It would also be great if you could rate it because that really helps others find the series. Check out The Nightmare Before Christmas on Disney Plus and listen to the soundtrack wherever music is enjoyed. <laughs>